Welcome to Ask the Experts. I'm Jill Schlesinger, editor-at-large of CBSMoneyWatch.com, and he is... Jack Otter, executive editor of MoneyWatch.com. See how, what a great ploy that was? Then I don't have to remember that title. Oh, I see. Yep, sure. But sometimes the person sitting in this chair gets all kinds of praise and build-up okay, from Okay, let me you. do that again. Yeah. Hold on. Okay. And joining me today is one of the most thoughtful uh, financial gurus that you could find, uh, especially on whose office is next to mine, because there's only one office next to mine. Um, hmm. But uh, Jack Otter is a wealth of information about financial matters, investment matters, uh, bicycling, um, what else? Uh, give me some other big ones that you're that are fatherhood, fatherhood, sure, bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> and, they go together well, and the financial stuff. Yep, don't forget that. Uh, so Jack, that was nice. Thanks, Joe. That was good. You know why? Because you deserve it. Um, Jack, Snow Mageddon. This is our fifth storm in five weeks in New York. It's fabulous. Uh, you love it. I do. I, everyone's complaining to me. Oh, blah, blah, blah. I think it's fun. I mean, I understand it's a drag, especially if you live out of town. But what the heck? I think it's pretty. Yeah. It's fun to throw snowballs. Your kids didn't have any school today. No school today for the kids. Yeah. And no school. Public schools closed. Yeah. That doesn't happen that much. Actually, public schools close more than private schools. Not New York City. You don't think so? No way. Do you know that know. this is? Hold on. Megan is first of all. Megan, who is the queen of New York City, I do believe that this is the seventh time New York City schools have been closed since when? Didn't Pat tell us that this morning? Uh, ten years. In ten years, the seventh time. So you and your fancy private schools don't have to go to school as much. As a kid, to tell you the truth, uh, at my fancy private school, we um we would trudge through the snow on days when mm. public schools had off. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Mm. Well, we are our fancy Uphill public school. Both ways. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. I like that. Uh, you know, it, there is some cost to all of this snow stuff. First of all, New York City has blown sure. through its uh, snow removal budget, oh, as yeah. I learned from Katie Couric last night. So, too, have places like Atlanta, Georgia. <laughs> and we have a guest directly coming up the, from Atlanta, Georgia, who will give us the on-the-ground update of all snow services in Atlanta, I'm sure. Excellent. Um, and uh, Dow's reaching 12,000 or hovering around that level. How are you feeling about that, Jack? Well, we, you know, we pundits, we, we financial gurus are always supposed to say it doesn't make any difference. It's just a number. Mm. But look, if it, if it causes you to reflect on the fact that the Dow has nearly doubled in less than two years, who knows, we could double in two years, if we, depending on where we are in March. It's not bad to think about that, what the implications of that are. Right. Um, and, and, or not only that, just get you to actually do something. Yeah, sure. So action is not bad. Yep. And the one thing that should not get you to do is to say, okay, so maybe stocks are, are all right, and to go <laughs> from your 100% cash position and dump it all in stocks. That's the thing it should not. When people start doing do. a lot of that, I hope I recognize it's a sell signal. Yeah. But there's no evidence of that just yet. No. In fact, just the contrary. Yeah. So uh, It's only a trickle. And interestingly enough, when you really think about it, that most of the ordinary investors, many, I shouldn't say most, have actually missed the entire move from 6,500 to 12,000. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? It, it, it's, it, on the one hand, it seems amazing, but it's just so typical and right. perfect. Right. Yeah. And so uh, on the other end of the spectrum is the, uh, you know, we see Dow 12,000. We also get some news that uh, the, the weekly jobless numbers were pretty bad. And we know that people are still having some hard time in managing their, their lives and their credit. And so do you think the economy is like, are, you know, are you on that Obama train <laughs> from the State of the Union? You still high from the State of the Union? Or do you, how do you feel we, where we are in the economic situation? Uh, well, my theory is from the beginning, it's very boring. I think we will muddle through. I don't think it's going to be great. I don't think it's going to be terrible. Uh, I don't think we're going to crash again. The, the, the key element that I think is always missing from the analyses is the lack of demand. Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. think people fully understand that we were running on pretend demand not for a year or two of the real estate, you know, the end of the real estate bubble, but potent, by, by some accountings for two decades. We were buying more than we were making. And so we were building entire factories to supply goods to people who were buying them with money they actually didn't have. Uh huh. And, and so it's going to take a long time to get back into balance. And, and so that's why I'm actually not particularly concerned about inflation right now. Stagflation, perhaps, but not not really true inflation. And stagflation being the uh, when you have basically prices going up, but the economy not growing. No growth, yeah. Maybe a little sad. But I think line. I think that's probably unlikely. <clears throat> I mean, my my point is there's a lot of slack demand. Uh, 
you see a great example in the car industry, which went from selling 16 million vehicles to 11 million. I think that exists everywhere. It's just not as obvious. Yeah. And, you know, when people say, like, well, why aren't these bad companies hiring? I say, because you're not buying enough of their stuff. <laughs> right. And if you buy more of their stuff, they'll hire more people. So um, we're going to also uh, shift gears a little bit here because we do have our special guest star who would have been here live, Jack, sitting in this poor empty chair that is empty right now. Instead, we go to Skype and we have John Alzheimer, who is joining us from Atlanta, Georgia. So, uh, John, how you doing, man? Uh, I am doing very, very well. I'm actually very disappointed that I couldn't be there. I had three flights canceled and one Delta called me at 4 a.m. this morning telling me that my 6.30 a.m. was rescheduled till sometime late this afternoon. I figured it was time to pull the plug and uh, leverage the technology of Skype. There you go. And John, I just want you to know that uh, when Megan and I were talking about <laughs> this yesterday, I did say to her, there is no there is no snowball's chance in hell, if you will, that he's going to make it here. She goes, I don't know. He sounds like he really wants to be here. Well, you are here. Let me do your intro. John uh, Alzheimer is a nationally recognized expert on credit reporting, credit scoring, and identity theft. He is the president of Consumer Education at Smart credit.com and the credit blogger for mint.com formerly of fico equifax and credit.com john is the only recognized credit expert who actually comes from the credit industry he may be the only one who's in atlanta right now for all i know you know yeah, i'm all alone that's true and it's interesting you talked about how we dealt with the weather a couple of weeks ago when we got hammered with this and we, we, we got about five percent of what you guys got in the northeast <laughs> And it closed down the city for a week. All the schools, all businesses, most of the side streets were pretty much, um, you know, undrivable for the better part of the week. So we, we had it really bad. Um, but at the very least, uh, no one no one got hurt seriously. Well, you know, um, my friends over at Wood Radio, Jack knows this station very well, W-O-O-D Radio in Grand Rapids, don't say it. Um, oh, darn <laughs> do it. Do not say it. Nice. In Grand Rapids told me that the problem with uh, us wimps here on the East Coast is we just don't have the right equipment. And I think they meant like the internal fortitude to deal with it. So the people at Wood said we don't have the right equipment, huh? Correct. All right, just yes. checking. All yeah. right. Anyway, John, if you were here, you would see how much bad punditry we could do live. <laughs> but here we have it. Okay, we got so many questions. We, uh, I apologize for those of you if we don't get to your question today. Uh, here's one question that came in again and again. John, people want to know, how does closing a credit card really affect the credit score? We hear all that, that we hear that it lowers your score, but how significant is it? Should people be worried about it? And how long does it take for your score to actually recover? That's actually a, a, an excellent question because it, it comes from one of the most prevalent myths with respect to credit scoring, which is that closing a credit card account actually helps your score. Um, when in reality, the exact opposite is true. Here, here's the issue with respect to closing a card. There is a component within all risk scoring systems, FICO included, called revolving utilization. And revolving utilization is the relationship between the balances on your open credit cards and the credit limits on the open credit cards. The ratio is, is factored like this. The aggregate balance is divided by the aggregate limit. Then that figure is multiplied by 100 and it yields percentage. You want that percentage to be as low as possible because that's good for your score. So having a $100 balance on a $1,000 credit card is 10% utilization. That's actually very healthy. Closing credit cards or otherwise lowering credit limits actually lowers your aggregate amount of credit limit. And so even if you don't charge any more as far as uh, taking on new debt in, in the form of a balance, your utilization percentage is going to go up and therefore your credit score is likely to go down. So how meaningful is this? Well, debt is a 30% category in your FICO score. So it is extremely important, very, very meaning, meaningful, a close second behind whether or not you're actually making the payment or not. So it's an important figure and you should pay a lot of attention to it. Closing a retail store credit card with a $500 limit, not gonna be a big deal. Closing a credit card with a 20 or $25,000 limit is probably going to be pretty significant. And Thanks for bottom lining that for me because I had no idea what the hell you were talking about for a while there, credit utilization. So you have a big limit and you cut and you close that out. That will have a much more significant impact on your credit score. A little one, a pizzicaca card, close out, no biggie, right? No, 
No biggie. Excellent. Next question. Now, keep it shorter here, man. I can't follow you. I'm like, I, I, I'm in remedial credit, remember? Here's a question from Tony. Are there credible, successful companies who perform credit repair services? Because we know there's an awful lot of them that are not reputable or credible. Yeah, and it's one of the big myths with respect to credit repair companies is they are operating outside the limit of the law, and that's not true. Credit repair is not illegal. Um, doing it illegally is illegal. There's an act called the Credit Repair Organizations Act, which defines how a credit repair organization must do business in order to comply with federal law. There are a lot of companies that do credit repair. Some of them are reputable, and when I say reputable, I you actually get a service in exchange for the subscription that you pay every single month. There are, however, some that will take your money and run. My bottom line on credit repair is this, is that really what they're doing is they're disputing information on your credit reports, trying to get it off before the statute of limitations expires. So, you know, you have to decide whether or not you want to write those letters yourself for free or if you want to pay someone to write them for you. Jack, what do you think? You think people can motivate themselves to do it? <laughs> well, it's like so many issues in finance, getting a financial advisor, um, you know, all, all these things, balance, rebalancing your, um, your, uh, your portfolio we talk about a lot. So I, I think it doesn't hurt to hire somebody if, if, you've, if, you, if you know yourself, you know, you're, right. you're not going to get around to it. I do think, though, we ought to put up a, a warning flag. I mean, the reason that there are reports about bad companies out there is because there are bad companies out there. So we should warn people to be careful about which one they go to. Mm -hmm. And perhaps we can ask our expert how to tell. Yeah. So how can you tell? You can ask uh, that yourself. <laughs> it, it's interesting. It's an interesting dilemma. Is that credit repair gets a really, really bad rap? But if you look at the Federal Trade Commission's list of of uh, the volume of consumer complaints, credit repair really isn't even in the top five. Wow. And other things like subscription services and identity theft, those really tend to take the cake with respect to complaints. So it's really work with someone who is a reputable company that you know has been around for a while. Um, what happened in the aftermath of the mortgage meltdown is a lot of mortgage brokers all of a sudden got into the credit repair. <laughs> That's awesome. Like, <laughs> ah, one business, one door shuts and another window will open. Let me jump right through that one. Well, but what's great is that they helped cause the problem that they're now making money solving. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, yeah. that's good. I, right. I, 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 it's like I'm going to become a fireman after I've set the fire myself. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. Perpetual monetization. <laughs> oh, I love it. All right, here we go. Dean wants to know, does it hurt your credit score to take advantage of balance transfer offers to basically float a balance for up to several years? Uh, Dean's been moving his balance from one card to another when the 0% interest, minimum monthly payments, promotional offers end. So is there any downside to doing those transfers? That, believe it or not, from a credit scoring perspective, there's actually upside to doing balance transfers. And, and here's why. Remember the first questions you asked about utilization? Um, Can you stop time, using that word? I hate it. <laughs> Just use a different word. I can't stand that. Just use it. Let's make something up like um, debt usage. Debt usage. OK. All right. I like that better. Every time you open a new credit card in order to transfer a balance to it, you're opening a new card that has some sort of a credit limit. And as long as you keep the prior card or collection of cards open, after five or six credit cards, you have about 60 or $70,000, maybe even more, maybe a little bit less, of available credit on those cards. If you keep the same balance, then your usage percentage goes down every single time you do that. The theory is, is that you are, you know, you're, you're taking advantage of 0% offers, it's free money. And if you don't charge into each one of those cards, then you actually could probably help your score by doing so. Wow, that's kind of interesting to know. I didn't know that. Have Mike, you ever, have, wait a second, have you ever done that? Have you ever done a balance transfer? Uh, when we got, when I got married, it's probably you. Really blame your wife right now. I'm going to hit you. An expensive wedding, <laughs> and so we, uh, I, I did transfer some of the price of the wedding onto a zero percent card and paid it off before it came due. So nice. it was a good move. Yeah. All right. So yeah. and and your credit score did not suffer as a result. I didn't have to check it for a while, but we bought an apartment not too long after that. But my question would be, at what point do you start opening too many cards? And I've also heard that the mere inquiry, a credit inquiry, or there's some kind of a credit inquiry that can trigger um, problems on your FICO score. Yeah, that's the downside. The downside is every time you open one of these cards, you're actually applying for credit, which means there's a new inquiry. But remember, the inquiry only goes on one of your three credit reports, so it's only going to affect one of your three FICO scores. Hmm. Whereas the new account will likely show up on all three of your credit reports. And if it's got enough 
uh, availability or, or, or credit limit, you're actually going to see that little percentage go down every single time you do it. Here's another thing to keep in mind. Every time you add a new account to your credit report, you're making your credit report look younger because it takes the, the score takes an average measurement of the age of all of the accounts on the credit report. So just be aware that if you do this as a young person, it may not help you as much as if you do this like me as an old person. Or us. Well, sure, that's a nice way to look younger. Open I know. Credit card. I've, been, a... I've been looking for that. That and dyeing my hair. It works beautifully. Uh, here's one from Simone. Uh, does being an authorized user on credit cards boost your credit as long as the primary person is paying the bills on time? It, that's, a, that's a simple question. The answer is absolutely yes. Ah, uh, being an authorized user on a credit card is like having a credit card with training wheels. You don't have any liability in most cases, but you do get the benefit of having that card on your credit report. And if it's got a high limit, a low balance, it's well aged, and it's being paid on time, then it actually can cause your score to skyrocket in some cases. And at the very least, it's going to be it's going to have some positive influence. Now, if they max the card out, miss payments, file bankruptcy or do any of the nasty things you can do with, with credit card debt, then obviously you're going to want to get your name off the card because that stuff also shows up on your credit report. All right. That's good to know. Now, Paula asked us, and I think everybody wants to know this, who carries credit card balances. Is there a some magic solution to getting a lower rate on your credit card besides nudging them and, say, and asking for it? Is that really the best way to do it? Uh, nudging them is definitely option number one because it's free and it generally – it works – a, a some percentage of the time. Five years ago, if we would have had this conversation, I would have said it works a lot of the time. Today, it doesn't work a lot of the time. Hmm. Um, if if you are in trouble and you need your limit or your rate lowered because you are having a hard time making the payment, then that's something you're probably going to need outside help for with a through a nonprofit financial counseling like with one of the member agencies of the NFCC. Um, but if you just want a lower interest rate because you just want a lower interest rate. The credit card issuing community is not as flexible with that type of request these days for obvious reasons. Um, number one is it's the cost to comply with the card act is costing them an arm and a leg. Uh -huh. Now I have Big Brother checking in from New Jersey, also known as our editor in chief, Eric, and he wants to know, are some credit cards worse than others in terms of your actual score? Like our departments, like if I get a card from Neiman Marcus, Will the agency say she's going to spend a lot of money versus <laughs> Target may not be as bad? Like, but is there any differential between or among different types of cards? The, the, the brand of the card or the style of the card, retail versus credit card versus charge card, that's not necessarily the big issue. But here's the problem with retail store cards is that they almost always have a very, very low credit limit. You don't have a $25,000 limit at Neiman Marcus. You may have a five. Well, you may not, <laughs> but I beg to differ when it comes to my mother. <laughs> with apologies to your mother, I move on. Um, so here's the issue with those retail store cards where you can get your score in trouble. Even modest purchases, a suit, a pair of boots, something that, that is five or $600 can eat up a lot of the credit limit causing that usage percentage to be very, very high, while the same purchases on a ten or twenty thousand dollar Visa mm. Discover card is almost meaningless to that percentage. So keep keep that in mind. Okay. Now, Eric, if Eric has any other questions, just remind me not. Uh, he's mad that I called him Big Brother. Well, let's oh. just call him, like my brother. You're my brother. Yo, brother. Uh, Holly wants to know. She has been receiving many credit card offers lately, and she just finally decided to apply for a card that would give her a zero percent interest on balance transfers for fifteen months. Now she's currently unemployed, searching for work, and not surprisingly, the credit card company declined her application because of her employment situation, but she wanted to at least try. Will being declined hurt her credit score and show up on her credit report? The answer to the question is no. The inquiry will show up because, well, if they pulled a credit report, if they went that far in the process and pulled a credit report, the inquiry will show up, and that's the only thing that can have any sort of effect on the score. The fact that she has been declined, or on the other side, if she would have been approved, that particular decision yes or no is not on the credit report. And by the way, don't don't blame the credit card issuer for that. The Card Act mandates that they decline someone who has no income. So that's something that they have to follow with respect to federal law now. That seems reasonable to me. <laughs> yeah. No income, no credit. Not a bad idea. If you can't afford the house, maybe you shouldn't buy it. That, right. that kind of logic. Seems you know, I will throw in one thing, though. Holly's experience is meaningful for Paula. Because if Holly does not have a job, even if she's getting declined, she's still getting an offer for a 0% for 15 months. 
if I'm Paula and I'm paying in the 20s and um, and I've got a good credit score, right. I'm going to call up and say, hey, guys, you know, I just got this offer for whatever the latest is. Uh, what can you do to be Right. It? I think that makes sense. Um, now, here's one. Um, Hugh wants to know what's the best, safest way to accurately check your credit score. Jack, you want to take a whack at that? Or not? Um, do I have to play the guitar and drive my car and I, sing no, the song? No, I think, isn't it, um, wait a second, John, are we wrong if I say, is it uh, annualcreditreport.com for 10 bucks? Annualcreditreport.com is where you would go to get your federally mandated free credit reports, but you're not going to get a free score from that site. If you want to spend a little bit of money, then you can buy your scores, but just keep in mind that some of the scores that you're buying from some of these websites are not the same scores that Chase, uh, Discover, Amex are using to make decisions. Hmm. Which one are they using? Well, they're generally using the FICO brand. Right. Of and unless the score that you're buying is overtly branded on the website as being a FICO score, you're not getting a FICO score. You're just getting the Experian or the whatever it is. You're, that, you're just getting that credit report. Dig a little bit on the website and you'll find that a lot of these these companies will disclose this is not a so-called FICO score. And if it doesn't say that, look, if you want to buy it just to kind of get an understanding of where your score probably is, look, it's your money, rock and roll. But if you're not <laughs> a FICO score, you probably are not. Now, if you have a friend, for example, like I do, who's a mortgage broker, that person can get your credit score, can't they? He, she, it? Uh, absolutely. They can get all three of your credit reports and all three of your credit scores, but... Remember, the day after, everyone who looks at your credit report is going to think you just applied for a mortgage. Right. Ooh. Very interesting. Um, now, uh, my boss wants to know, uh, what's your point of view on rewards cards? Are they worth it? If so, which ones do you like the best? I Look, I'll be very honest about rewards no cards. No lie. <laughs> rewards cards are structured to reward the issuer. Um, they're not structured to reward the card holder. The interest rate... Um, rewards cards is generally higher. And if you're if you sit down and actually do the math with respect to how much you have to spend to buy whatever your reward would be at, even at retail, versus how much you had to spend on the card to earn it through a points type of structure, it's actually better in many cases just to go ahead and buy it straight out. I'll give you a great example. My flight that never occurred to LaGuardia <laughs> cost me $268. However, on my Miles card, I'm not going to throw anybody under the bus here. On my Miles card, I would have had to spend $25,000 turn enough points in order to get that same ticket. $25,000 in spending in order to earn a $260. <laughs> that doesn't necessarily work in the favor. Uh, I, I will endorse that theory, one or not theory, that those facts 100% and say that knowing that full well, I still do use a points card. Uh, I used to use a branded airline card and then found out that, of course, you have to look 330 days in advance and you can only fly to, you know, Greenland via Atlanta to use your, your Delta, or your US Air, your Continental card. But I, so I switched to a card that just gives me generic points. Right. And, you know, uh, I'm a busy guy. Uh, yes, you I, are. I, I racked up miles over years and years and years and years. And it was in June, I guess, that my wife and I went to the Turks and Caicos. And it cost me an absurd 100,000 points. <laughs> but we got exactly the flights we wanted on the day we wanted. And you know what? I probably, I, I didn't do a dollar of spending be to get miles. It was just stuff we were naturally buying. So, and I probably could have done better with a, with a cash back card. But I got to tell you, it felt really nice to fly nonstop uh -huh. to the Turks and Caicos on that rewards card. Can I make a suggestion with respect to rewards cards? Look, you're right. Rewards cards are not going away. But cashback cards are very easy to understand. You know why? Because cash doesn't have a blackout date. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We understand the value of a dollar. We may not understand the value of a thousand miles. So at the very least... Don't get it over your head. If you're going to choose to use a rewards card, fine. Choose a cashback card. All right. I did just use, I'll admit it, 75,000 miles to book a uh, first-class round-trip ticket to L.A. in March. I did it. But they were sitting there. What am I going to do? i got to use them, right? That's true. I'm an idiot. Uh, all right. Now, here we have some questions here from uh, Miss Jane in our chat room. If you want to go to our chat room, go to moneywatch.com, and you'll see we have the Ask the Experts banner at the top. Click on that. We've got this gorgeous chat room going on. And Jane wants to know, uh, just going back to that earlier question, when you request your free credit report, does that count as a credit inquiry? Uh, excellent question. Yay, Jane. Uh, 
the the answer to the question is yes and but ha however it, here's the rule every time anybody goes into your credit report whether it's you the credit bureau or a lender they have to post an inquiry but there are two types of inquiries there are hard inquiries and soft inquiries soft inquiries have no effect on your score and no lender ever sees them when you ask for your own report that is a soft inquiry okay. so it's there but it has no negative impact on you in any way Jane follows up. She says, if she's planning to buy a house a year from now, what should she be doing within the next 12 months to improve her FICO score? So 12 months, the clock is ticking, John. She wants to improve her, her score before she goes out and applies for a mortgage. What are the things she needs to think about? I, I'll tell her what she can do in the next 12 minutes to improve her nice. score. Um, the most actionable way to improve your score very quickly is to pay off or pay down credit card debt. That's it, period. Mm -hmm. The only other way to, to, to seriously improve your score is if you have negative information on your credit report that you can get removed. Either it's not yours or maybe a credit repair company is successful on your behalf. That's the other way, but there's no guarantee there. I guarantee you if you pay off your credit card debt, your score will go up, and in many cases, it will go up significantly. Hmm, that's very interesting. So, but in the meantime, she should go on to annualcreditreport.com and pull one of those reports, right, and make sure there's nothing negative? Here's the deal. With, with respect to mortgages, she should actually claim all three of the reports because mortgage lenders, unlike any other type of lender in this country, pull all three of your credit reports, Equifax, Experian, TransUnion, and all three of your respective FICO scores from all three of those bureaus and then take the middle score when they make their decision. So she's going to want to see what's on all three of them. Uh, I, I've got just in terms of cleaning up credit, there's a, there, there is wild action going on in the chat room right now. Um, and Narissa wants to know that uh, how does she remove an original creditor from her credit report after paying the collection agency? So, in other words, it's still sticking around. How does she get them get rid of them? Yeah, they tend to morph. You have the original creditor who then outsources it to a third party collector and you have both things showing up in your credit report. I, I don't have good news for her, unfortunately. Both of them are, it's completely legal to report both of those accounts and they both have a statute of limitations for seven years from the date the original account went into default. So she just got to add seven years to that date and that's how long it's going to stick around. Oh, these mistakes, wow. they follow you around. Nancy wants to know, how does marrying someone with a bad credit score affect someone with good credit? This is also, see, it feels like a Match.com question. <laughs> and if you wait the seven years for things to drop off, what <laughs> happens to your score in the end? So let me do two questions. Uh, what ha happens if you marry a deadbeat? And then once you clear up the deadbeat's problems, uh, what happens? Is your score kind of restored seven years after the fact? Well, the, the beauty of it is, is that credit reports are maintained at the individual consumer level. So just because you marry somebody, you don't all of a sudden have a joint married credit report <laughs> for that person. So... You, you can have a FICO 800 and your spouse can have a FICO 500 and they will never bleed over into each other until you allow them to do so by applying jointly for items like credit cards, auto loans, and mortgages. And then that is when lenders are going to pull both credit reports and then consider your good risk and your husband's bad risk when, when uh, yielding your interest rate. Now, if you marry that person and you teach them the error of their ways and instead there's all that stuff is gone... Over the period of time that that stuff ages, it's actually going to lose negative value against you. So your score will improve organically if you do nothing more than just stop doing bad things. And at seven years when that stuff falls off, then you are you're in great shape. But Nancy, remember what Mrs. Schlesinger always said. It's just as easy to find someone with a good credit score <laughs> as a bad credit score. She didn't exactly say that. but I think, I think it, the marriage should go forth. You think? Yeah. Just you're romantic. Don't apply together. Kevin says he's got at least a dozen credit cards, major brands, store cards. He pays them all off in full every month. Uh, many of the cards have high limits, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars Credit score is consistently in the high 700, low 800 range. Uh, is there a point at which you can have too much credit? Here's That's an interesting question. No, there isn't. Um, and, and he is a great example, a quantified example of how you can have a lot of credit cards and use them a whole lot and have a fantastic set of credit scores. There is nothing wrong with having credit. So, he does, And he doesn't need to close any of these cards uh, or anything? No, absolutely not. Okay. He is a case study in what and and doing it right and having a lot of credit cards. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. It's just manage them properly. Don't miss the payments and make sure you don't carry those balances over. Very good. You, so this, of course, would be the other um, Susan Schlesingerism, which it used to be, which before anorexia. So with all due respect, you can never be too rich or too thin. You can never have too much credit either. 
right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Remember, it's all, it's all about that ratio, that percentage that you don't want me to talk about. The more credit limit <laughs> you have, the lower that percentage is going to be. Let's call it the unmentionable ratio from now on. <laughs> Margaret wants to know, <laughs> how do I get Spiegel and Casual Corner cards off of my report? Both companies are out of business, and yet they're they're showing up on the report. So what up with that? All right. Well, here's the deal. The, the Fair Credit Reporting Act gives everybody in the country the right to challenge anything our, on our credit reports for free. All right. That's our right. Now, when you challenge the validity of those of that item or those two accounts with the credit bureaus, they're going to attempt to contact the furnisher of that information to verify the accuracy. If they do not get a response, then they have to remove it after 30 days because it's unverifiable. Okay? Ooh. And, and so there's but I, I will caution her this. If they are good accounts, they were never late. They're in good standing. I would not try to get those removed because you'll never get them back on the credit report and you're going to lose any positive value they were they are having towards your score so again don't get them removed if they're in good standing all right and there's nostalgia oh yeah. spiegel oh remember gosh spiegel. remember wanamakers you probably don't even know that but anyway there's a you know a whole a whole no- host of retailers gimbals that, on gimbals. my credit report there you go okay uh, megan just gonged us john it has been so much fun we can't wait to have you back here live but we um are gonna stop the show you have been as always just amazing um Remember, John Alzheimer, nationally recognized expert on credit reporting, and you can go to smartcredit.com, the consumer education part of that site, and see all the fun stuff that John does. Um, And you will come back and you will bring some warm Atlanta weather, maybe? Absolutely. And more credit heat is on the way. Oh, (laughs) baby. I love it. So thanks so much, John. It's been great seeing you. Thanks again. Enjoy the snow. Thank you so much. Uh, Jack, have you learned a lot? I have, yeah. I have have really learned a lot. It's amazing. Um, Well, next week, who knows what's going to happen? Oh, I forgot to ask him Eric's last question, but I think you might know this. Hold on a second, Jack. Um, Which was, should everyone have a fraud alert just to be safe? I think the answer is yes, isn't it? I don't know any downside, but... Hmm. I think think the answer is yes. um, But what you you don't want to do is you don't want to pay for those various insurance services that you're offered. Okay, just want to make sure. Um, Eric, go out and make some snow angels. I told you that earlier today. Jack Otter, it's been a fabulous show. Has been wonderful. Really, as always. Are Um, you going to go skiing, snowshoeing this weekend? I don't think so. Okay. I I might might order in a lot. Is it going (laughs) to snow again? I don't know. I don't think so. All right. Well, if you want to know, if, if you want to know more about the snow, credit, investments, money, whatever. You tune in next week. This has been Ask the Experts at MoneyWatch.com. We will see you next week. I'm Jill Schlesinger. I'm Jack Otter. And uh, thank you so much for watching. Snow, snow, <laughs> snow, snow, snow. It won't be long before we'll all be there with snow, snow.